At VMworld 2018, I presented a breakout session on vCenter performance. In this, five, in this short video, I'd like to go over one of the most commonly asked questions that I get, and I'm going to use some of the material from that slide deck. Specifically, I'm going to talk about how many concurrent operations we can perform in vCenter. I get asked this question a lot. So let's start with some global information. In vCenter, there are two hard limits. The first is that you can perform approximately 600, you can issue approximately 600 concurrent tasks to vCenter before it will start queuing up subsequent tasks. So if you try to send 700, about 600 will be, execu will, will be executed and the rest will be queued up. In addition, vCenter has a hard-coded limit of 2,000 concurrent sessions. So those are 2,000 logins. After that, any subsequent login attempts will fail. I should note, by the way, that those sessions also include remote console sessions. So some combination of logins and remote console sessions. Now those are vCenter global limits. There are also some per host limits that are very important. For example, think of each host as having 16 available slots. And so when you issue operations to that host, you consume those slots. Each host starts with 16 slots. If you issue, if v, if you issue a clone or a vMotion from vCenter, then it takes up two of those slots, as I show here. A storage vMotion is a bit more expensive. It takes up eight of those slots. A linked clone only takes up one of those slots, but it does require a snapshot. And so if a snapshot doesn't already exist, it will go ahead and take one. And finally, if you're trying to clone a powered on VM, vCenter has to take a snapshot first before it actually does the clone. And so you might see some slight serialization there. Let me depict some of these pictorially. So imagine that you want to clone a VM from host A to host B. When you perform this clone operation, as I said on the previous slide, it costs two of these slots. So as a source, host A is charged two slots. As a destination, host B is charged two slots. And so, as you can see, if each of them has a total of 16 slots, two of them are taken up by this clone operation, and each of them has 14 slots. And those slots, again, can be used for other provisioning operations. So that's the simple case of a clone. Now, let's imagine that we're actually cloning from one host to itself. Well, because that host is both the source and the destination of the clone, that host is actually charged four slots, as I show here, and B is unused. I bring up this case because in the past, I'd seen examples where folks had large VDI environments, and what they would do is they would clone a single VM across a number of different hosts in their infrastructure. And the trick there is then the one host that contains that VM ends up being a point of serialization, a bottleneck. So it's actually better to distribute a bunch of different templates and clones throughout the system so that you can get better concurrency on those clone operations by spreading them out across source hosts. So that was a simple clone uh, operation. Let's now look at a few other limits. Data stores have similar limits to hosts. A data store has about 128 available slots. Whenever there is a vMotion that's occurring on that data store, that consumes one slot. So you can imagine a data store can have 128 vMotions in flight at once. A storage vMotion is a bit more expensive. It costs 16 slots. So on a given data store, you can have up to eight concurrent storage vMotions. This becomes important if you have, let's say, for example, you have a vSAN cluster. Well, that vSAN cluster will be limited to this number of concurrent operations. And that's, that's somewhat orthogonal to the vCenter limit. So, vCenter can consume up to 600, but if it's trying to send a request to a data store, it's beholden to these limits. There are also per NIC limits, and this can get a little confusing, so I'm going to talk about it more in the next slide. If you have a 1 gig NIC in your ESX host, that, can perf that has up to four slots available for vMotion operations. If you have a 10 gig NIC, it has twice the number. It has up to eight slots for vMotion. And a vMotion costs one unit. So you can see that you can do up to four concurrent vMotions with a one gig NIC and up to eight with a 10 gig NIC. We recommend that you actually have a separate vMotion NIC. And if you have extra NICs or port groups available, we recommend you create a separate vSphere provisioning NIC. This is so that clone traffic and provisioning traffic travels on a different network from your standard management traffic. 
Now, while these limits can be changed, we don't officially support them. Instead, we're trying to work on, on doing the necessary due diligence to see if we should increase these limits. And if you have feedback, we're happy to hear from you. Let's get back to the per NIC limits briefly. So imagine I want to vMotion a VM from host A to host B. Well, of course, that requires copying a number about a lot of traffic over the physical NIC. Now, remember that there's now two limits at play. A host is charged two, two units for being involved in a vMotion. So because host A is the source, it's charged two units. Because host B is the destination, it is also charged two units. And so as you see here, I depict the free slots available to each host. Again, that's not the only limit that we have to consider. We also have to consider the NIC limits. When you do a vMotion, the NIC is tied up, and therefore that NIC is charged one unit. On both the source and the destination, it's charged one unit. As we said in the previous slide, each NIC for a 10 gig NIC has a total of eight slots. And so the picture looks something like this, where now if you're vCenter, you're looking at a host and you have to consider both of these sets of limits as you issue operations. Let me get, go through one final example. Imagine that you actually have two vMotions in flight at once. Imagine that you're doing a vMotion from host A to host B, as we showed in the previous slide. But now imagine you're doing a vMotion from host C to host B. So now host B is involved in two vMotions at the same time. So obviously host A is performing a vMotion, so the host cost is two. Host B is, is involved in two vMotions, so it's charged four units. Host C is involved in one vMotion, so it's charged two units. Similarly, host A's NIC has to be charged, so it's, it, the cost of a vMotion for the NIC is one. Host B has two vMotions happening, and so it's being charged twice. Host C is involved in one vMotion, so it's charged once. And to make it easier, I show this graph, here, this picture here, where I show that B, the ho for the host-specific limits, it's being charged four slots. And host A and C are charged fewer because they're only involved in one vMotion each. And from a NIC perspective, the picture looks pretty similar. So now you can see here that vCenter has to consider both of these types of limits as it's issuing operations. Hopefully, with this brief overview of these slides, you'll have a better understanding of how concurrency works in vCenter. Just to wrap up, overall, vCenter has its own limits, namely 600, around 600 concurrent tasks and 2,000 sessions. And then there are per host, per host, per data store, and per NIC limits that further limit the concurrency. And we do that so that we can have a good resource balance between running VMs and doing provisioning operations. Thank you very much for your time.